the, the advice I would give to the military, and I'd be happy to talk to them in private to make exactly these points. The real result in this recent election has been so overwhelming for Imran Khan and his supporters that it doesn't help the military uh, to stand in the way of the popular voice. The message I guess I would give to supporters of Imran Khan is you, you've got right on your side here in terms of the legitimacy of the popular vote. I'll put it this way, it's more excessively friendly to China. Uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese effort to gain hegemony along the long Indo-Pacific periphery is really very serious. Assalamu alaikum, this is Moeed Pizada with a very warm welcome to Ambassador Bolton. Ambassador Bolton has served as National Security Advisor, United States National Security Advisor with Trump administration. He has also served as U.S. Ambassador to UN, but that's not all. He's a Washington insider for almost 40 years, starting from Reagan administration, with increasing levels of responsibility. He's very deeply interested in international relations. He has uh, written extensively. He's a prolific author as well. His latest book, The Room Where It Happened, uh, is in my hands over here. I'm going to refer to it as well. And um, uh, let me also add this thing that I didn't buy it from here. I bought it in um, I bought it in Islamabad in 2020, where it was selling like hotcakes, you know, and from a very prominent bookseller, Said Book Bank. So Ambassador Bolton, thank you so much uh, for finding time for me. I understand that you have a very busy schedule. But um, let me first admit that this is an excellent, marvelous, this book, um, a panoramic view of the chaotic, conditions in which the Trump uh, presidency operated. However, I mean, I'm tempted to ask, before we move to US-Pakistan relationship, I'm tempted to ask that now, as of now where we stand, uh, in, in your interview with the TRT, the Turkish Radio and Television, I think in August 2023, uh, you admitted, almost in a way you claimed when he asked you, the anchor person asked you, that um, why you didn't cooperate in the impeachment proceedings at the Congress level. And he said, I knew they were frivolous, they're not going to succeed, but I wanted to break my book um, before the elections. And you thought that you, I mean, at least you, you thought that you contributed uh, in making awareness about the Trump's, um, uh, the way of government. But now it looks, when I look at the Supreme, even the Supreme Court is not convinced, they're not going to stop him. Uh, they're not agreeing with the Colorado, uh, the Supreme Court judgment. So it looks like as if Trump is all set to become the president once again. So how do you feel about it? Well, I think it's going to be a disaster for the United States if he's elected again. The, the trouble with the way the Democrats handled impeachment was they didn't do their arithmetic correctly. To convict in the Senate, you need two thirds. And by running a partisan impeachment, they guaranteed they would lose. So actually, the impeachment achieved the opposite of what its advocates wanted. Instead of punishing Trump, or at least containing and deterring Trump, by allowing him to escape conviction, they enabled Trump, they emboldened Trump, they made things worse. And I think that was entirely foreseeable. But just one quick more question. Uh, why do you think the, uh, despite all what the US intelligence here says, as an outsider, I wonder that why the Republican voter base and you've been part of the Republican Party for almost 40 years. Why is so enamored of Trump? Why Trump is such a big, big thing for them? Well, I think Trump is an aberration, but I think he embodies a lot of alienation and dissatisfaction in the American body politic. Uh, and uh, and he's capitalized on it. And I think it's to the detriment of the Republican Party. And if he wins, ultimately, to the detriment of the country. But, uh, but Ambassador Bolton, on the other hand, you have an ailing president. You also admitted in one of your interviews that he's senile, he's ailing, he's not necessarily the best person to lead the United States. On the other hand, you have someone which the Republican intelligentsia at the top level doesn't really like, but voters like. Is this not a crisis for the United States? Well, I don't think it's a happy event for the United States. Public opinion polls say 70 percent or more of the voting public doesn't want a choice again between Trump and Biden. And yet neither party seems to know what to do. It's not just a Republican problem. It's a problem with Biden, who's who's not fit to be uh, president. So uh, it's still a long way to November. I'm not saying uh, that the that the road is easy to stop Trump from getting the nomination or Biden on the Democratic side. But stranger things have happened. This is where this is a long way from being over. OK, so coming coming to the room where it happened, um, I it, it's 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 very interesting. It's difficult to put it down. I just went back to the book yesterday, the whole day. 
One thing that strikes me is, is that you have been the NSA, the National Security Advisor, for 17 months. There are 14 chapters in the book. There are more than 500 pages. Uh, there's hardly any mention of Pakistan, which was considered to be the frontline state. Uh, you, your president and you were talking of withdrawal from Afghanistan. You were against the idea of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. But you apparently from the book, the reader gets the impression that you had no substantive interaction with the Pakistani system, the government, the prime minister. Well, in, in fact, that's accurate. I, I didn't have much interaction with Pakistani officials during my 17 months. Partially, that has to do with what was going on. Uh, it could have been different in a different piece of the of the Trump administration. Uh, but it's also, I think, a fair criticism of our inability uh, in the Trump presidency to look at big picture issues uh, that had long range implications. You know, there's a saying in the United States that the urgent crowds out the important. And I think with Trump, since it was so chaotic all the time, uh, I would grade us not very highly on our ability to do long range planning and to deal with consequences of our decision, like uh, the effect of uh, uh, of the U.S. and NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan, like our inability uh, to do more to persuade Pakistan and others of the threat of China, uh, which I think is for the U.S. the existential threat of the 21st century. So I, I, I take your point, and uh, I wish that there were more than 24 hours in the day, but but it's the way it worked out in my tenure, I think I've tried to reflect in the book, and uh, uh, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a noteworthy point you're making. So Ambassador Baldwin, at the same time, uh, the, the, your presidency, the Republican administration, <clears throat> and the President Trump himself, was often in touch with the then Prime Minister Imran Khan. Uh, the, the, uh, in fact, the relations were actually more frosty. When the Trump came, the relations improved a bit. There was a sort of a reset. They met three, four times. The last time they met was in Davos uh, in, in the World Economic Forum. The Trump appreciated him. They used to talk on the telephone. When the Biden administration came on 20th January 2021, the relationship totally snapped. You know, the, the, the former Prime Minister Imran Khan kept on trying to congratulate uh, Biden. Do you have an idea what went wrong? Well, uh, I don't from the inside, but I think the connection between a lot of very high ranking officials in the Democratic Party and uh, Nawaz Sharif and, and his family and, uh, and earlier historical connections may be an explanation for it. Uh, I don't know that for sure. Certainly, Imran Khan said a number of unkind things about the United States over years. I, I, I would look forward at some point uh, to talking with him, whether he's the sitting president at some point or uh, a former candidate I, to talk about these issues substantively, because I think it's very important. Um, it, it's distressing that if there was this cutoff in the Biden administration, it has impeded their ability to say to the military now, you know, this is not going well for Pakistan, what has happened in this recent election, uh, which they should be saying. The State Department's issued a statement. I've endorsed that. But but I, I don't see the kind of contact that I would have expected uh, 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 from from the White House these days. But you mentioned unkind statements from Imran Khan, but most of those statements happened after February, uh, when his government was lost in, in April 2022, after the Donald Liu cipher affair, on which you also commented in the Voice of America discussion. But um, what other unkind uh, comments on the United States do you remember from the past, before 2022? I'll put it this way. It's more excessively friendly to China. Uh, you know, the, the the Chinese effort to gain hegemony along the long Indo-Pacific periphery uh, is really very serious. And, uh, you know, we've had this discussion with Pakistan over decades. Uh, and what I see is uh, China uh, trying to take advantage of Pakistan for its own purposes to increase its influence. Uh, and I think this is uh, this this is potentially very dangerous for Pakistan and and really for everybody who looks to long term peace and stability in the region. Ambassador Walton, I I would remind you there is your op ed piece, opinion piece uh, in Washington Post in August two thousand twenty one, after the fall of the Kabul. The article, the op ed piece, is time for equivocating about a nuclear armed Taliban friendly Pakistan is all. Now, apart from other things, you also say that a Persian army had a state. The Pakistan is a more or less the same situation. The Pakistani army also has a state and they do many things. I mean, you, you wrote that, right? 
And then you go on referring, not in the exact words, but you keep on referring to their double games they have been playing with the United States. And you are very clear in your understanding as NS, former NSA that the Pakistani state is run by the military. So when you refer to the strategic issues, no Pakistani prime minister, whether Imran Khan or Nawaz Sharif, had any control on the strategic issues. So why in your mind you blame Imran Khan for any strategic you know, uh, disagreements between the United States and Pakistan? Now, I'm not I'm not blaming Imran. I, what I'd like to see is a friendlier attitude toward the United States, which I think would benefit Pakistan. That That's the case I would like to make to the military, to Imran, to, to all Pakistani politicians. So so when you understand the power of the military, many Pakistanis are intrigued and surprised that um, despite having a critical tone towards the Pakistani military's different behavior and games, every administration every administration is more friendly towards the military than an elected Pakistani civilian government. Why is it so? Well, I don't know that I would say that uniformly. I mean, I will say after 9-11, uh, I worked for Colin Powell at the State Department then, and we worked very cooperatively with Pervez Musharraf and his government. Um, but the, the advice I would give to the military, and I'd be happy to talk to them in private to make exactly these points, is that uh, the, the, the result, the real result in this recent election has been so overwhelming for Imran Khan and his supporters that it doesn't help the military uh, to stand in the way of the popular voice. And it doesn't help Pakistan in withstanding China to be riven by these kinds of internal disputes. The Chinese will take advantage of it. One thing you can say, the difference between China and the United States is China's on your border. Right, and right. Uh, and the United States is not. And uh, what, what we have in mind for our best interest, I'm not hiding anything. I'm talking about what I think is America's best interest here is to keep Pakistan out of the Chinese orbit. They have already formed an axis between Beijing and Moscow. They have their satellites, their outriders, North Korea, Iran, Syria, Belarus. Uh, and if China had its way, because of its views toward India, among other things, let's be clear, uh, it would bring Pakistan into that orbit too. This would be a big mistake for Pakistan. So I understand that. I understand that being a keen student of international relations, where you're coming from. But were these issues ever discussed on the table with the Pakistani elected government that we want a certain kind of you know, balance between China and the United States? Well, there were times when there was a lot less balance. It was a lot. The relationship with the United States was much closer. And, and I don't see why that's not possible again. During my time in the White House, uh, that uh, that didn't occur. But I've been my first trip to Pakistan was in 1982 when I was at the U.S. Agency for International Development. So I have been there uh, on a number of, of occasions, you know, as they say on Facebook, the Pakistan U.S. relationship is complicated sometimes. But but getting to the core interest, I think it's very important, certainly from the U.S. view. And I also think from the Pakistani point of view, to resist the temptation to define it only as how Pakistan relates to India or how Pakistan relates to China, although both those things are very important. I mean, it's great. Just one last question. I understand there's so much of time pressure. Uh, you I'm, you, uh, I'm grateful that you mentioned that massive uh, rigging that has taken place in the Pakistani election, and it doesn't really do, do very well to the military's image. But many congressmen and senators have called upon the Biden administration not to recognize the dummy government the military is throwing up unless there are serious investigations. The State Department itself, you have appreciated that in your tweet. The State Department has, uh, has asked for investigation into the massive rigging. Can you um, see United States and Biden administration not recognizing this Zardari Nawaz government, which the military is trying to throw up as a dummy, unless there is a serious you know, investigation into the alleged rigging? Well, I, I really can't predict what's going to go on inside the White House. Part of the problem is the president uh, really isn't on top of things 24-7. And, and that's a problem going forward for them politically in this country as well. The message I guess I would give to supporters of Imran Khan is you, you've got right on your side here in terms of the legitimacy of the popular vote. Don't, don't overplay your hand. It's going to work for you. But I would also say to the generals, and as I mentioned before, I'd be happy to say it to them in private, for goodness sakes, uh, perhaps 
perhaps you were misled about what the what the popular view was, but you know what it is now. Uh, it doesn't diminish the military's power or really the military's role in Pakistan to acknowledge what the actual vote is. I, I would argue to them it would strengthen the military if they acknowledged it. Thank you, Ambassador Bolton, and I look forward to having a greater, lo longer discussion with you on international relations at some point, whenever it's possible. I would look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you.